ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everyone hope you're doing well inshallah so last week or the week before we covered um, Qiyas a little bit about Qiyas yeah we actually did quite in quite a lot of detail I'm not going to go back to that just for completeness purposes Shah Waliullah Dehlavi does continue the discussion um, which I won't go into but I'll just point towards it is that um, he talks about how uh, he raises a question that if you're saying that when it comes to masla beneficial purposes then you can't use that for qiyas remember you can only use something that's given to you as a solid proof or a solid thing a, a solid um a, you can only use something that's actually given to you in sharia for qiyas right you can't just say oh well this must have um, an illa which is X, Y, and Z, which is from a Muslim perspective, you need to have a, you need to have a solid, solid foundation. So then he says, well, if you're saying that, then why do we find that some of the Sahabas, for example, um, here, did the companions, like they specified quantities, for example, and I'll just quickly touch upon this, I'm not going to go into it, um, but there is a discussion on this, that Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا دَرَقْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَقْصُرُ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ That when you travel, Throughout the land, there's no blame upon you for shortening the prayer. So we don't know, we don't get the shortening the number from the Quran. We get that from the Hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from four to two, for example. That's fine, but the actual distance numerically hasn't been specified by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you know how we often hear forty-eight miles. So um, the length of journey, uh, some Sahaba said it was four burud. You find a riwayah that says four burud. The most common hadith you'll hear is three days and three nights. You'll hear a hadith that says three days and three nights. So if you travel the distance, which is three days and three nights, then you become a musafir. Um, and people say, is it based on a camel? In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what about today? I mean, you can go around the globe, right? In, in less than that. So what happens, right? Are you a musafir technically? What happens? So... But the point here is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just said three days and three nights. So why do people then come along here? The example he gives is of some of the Sahaba, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala, Ibn Abbas, that they say, يَقْصُرَانِ وَيُفْتِرَانِ أَرْبَعَةَ بُرُودِ That they would do qasr if someone traveled for burud. That was 16 farsaq. Then I've written down here in the footnotes that it, rif- it roughly equates to 48 miles. Yeah. Um, however, there's lots, of, there's lots of debate amongst the ulama, even the 48 miles itself. But the objection here is this, that the Prophet just said, do qasr. And he just said, when you travel three days and three nights, that's it. So why are we making it specific? Why are we making this a quantify, quantifiable amount? When the Prophet never made a quantifiable amount. And the Sahaba, some of the Sahaba quantified it, but that's not, that's not uh, obligatory <coughs> upon us to follow the four days uh, to, f- to follow the 48 miles if we take that as an example um, so Shah Waliullah Dehlavi has an issue with this so, he, so he, he picks this particular example the Hanafis basically say if you look in the books of Hanafi like Imam Jassas for example they'll say that's true the Prophet never told us a mile mileage distance he just said three days and three nights but they say that the Sahaba understood this from the Prophet Sallallahu They understood what it was, so they gave it a distance. Shah Walila seems to be saying here is that they didn't mean to give, there was never intention to specify an amount. Yeah, it was just to set a boundary, like to just give, give you an, a, like a, you know like a rough estimate. If you're traveling four days and four nights, three days and three nights, that's you're, you're, for all intents and purposes you're a musafir, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu never specified a certain amount. He just specified it was just. It was just time bound, if you like, or space bound, right? You know, if you travel this far, if you travel what it would have taken, that's it. So, <clears throat> so you find some of the companions doing this. Shah Sahib says their intention was to uncover the beneficial purpose and to encourage others to it and to uncover the evil and discourage from it. So whenever they did the Sahaba, for example, in the Hanafi school, have like uh, 10 by 10 in terms of a well, a water, something falls into and so forth. The Prophet never said these things. Later on, people made these things. So why, why, why are we making things when the Prophet never specified? Remember what I said before, the usul is what? There's two types of knowledge. There's the maslaha, which is just a vague normative um, idea of beneficial purposes. And then you have a sharia, which gives you specific amounts, like farz, for zohar is four. 
right? So why are we then making these fix when the Prophet never fixed them? Do you, do you understand the question here? So this is a legitimate debate. Now most of the time we, we get into 48 miles and then people say, you know, from Blackburn to Batley, is it 48 miles and stuff? You know, and this is like becoming something that Imam Ghazali would have a problem with, for example, because you become very much like absorbed with all the details. And the Prophet is basically saying, when you're traveling, just, you know, just, just, just reduce it. Why are you fighting over all of these things? Right? So you see people getting all really, really ha into hair splitting debates. But some ulama I found that say, look, it's urf based on custom. So you know when you say, I'm, I'm going on a suffer, whatever's understood in suffer in your time, that's a suffer. So I'm going on a journey. That's it. You know? And so Sa Salman is desperately going to say something. We're going to let you speak, inshallah, at the end. Let me get through this, inshallah. Yeah, but you no, know, we, we'll debate this if you want. I'll leave some time at the end. So. In our example, originally most correct the distance of travel according to Fuqah, the Hanafi school is three days and three nights. However, that occurs. Right? They say, look, three days and three nights, if that's, how, if that's it, khalas, you're a musafir. Whatever it occurs. You don't need, because in those days, they never had like, you know, now we have it in your car. As soon as you saw the engine, you can set the dial and it tells you. That you had a camel, like you press, you could tell how much money. So they left it. Like, and it, was, it wasn't, the Sharia never was never, there was never trying to make these things fixed. The Prophet hasn't fixed it, why are we fixing it? So he, this is the question, okay? Therefore, um, so this is something to bear in mind as well, okay? Um, therefore, one needs to differentiate between a taqdeer shari'i, which is the sharia mandates that this is what the quantity is, and then something that's ijtihadi, the ulama come out with ijtihad. So you know when they say 48 miles, that's an ijtihadi thing. So you don't, you can't really like make a big issue out of it. It's ijtihad, they, they, in those days people said, and it changes with time, even if you use three days and three nights as modern forms of transport um, evolve and so forth, you know, you can, it's, it's very much up for grabs. But this has implications for lots of things, right? You know, uh, a sister traveling on her own, right? And all these other things as well. You can imagine that it has implications. Um, so in the former, the limit is real and determinative, whereas, for example, in Namaz, we know for Zohar it's four. Because the Prophet doesn't told us that, we know that's it, khalas. But when it comes to things to do with suffer, the mileage, the idea is to facilitate ease. So Shah Sahib says that these things people have made into like concrete numbers, but then they were, that was never the intention. Okay? So you say, okay, 48 miles in modern Britain is what uh, might be equal to three days and three nights. But if it's 40, fine. If it's 52, it's fine. Right? But you can imagine people really getting fixated about these things. But Shah Walula seems to be saying, well, that's not the issue here. The issue is that um, Allah just wants to give you ease. Yeah, so He's given you that, takes care of it. Um, the next discussion I'm going to leave, I'm not going to go into it. And there's something about how things become haram or wajib. Um, I leave that, all of that as well, inshallah. I won't go into all of that. Okay. I'm just showing you this so if someone's following the book, they know that um, I have made notes on it, but I'm not going to go into it because it's, it detracts from what we want to achieve, inshallah. Now, today, inshallah, So the next chapter, which is relevant for us because we're trying to cover the sunnah now, but the discussions that we've covered before will help you. The maslaha, the, 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 the idea of uh, values and so forth will help you. So, That, how does the sharia reach us from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So from the Prophet from 1400 years ago, how does it reach us today? Okay, so we're talking about the methods of how it reaches us. Okay, so there's two ways. Allah wajhain. There's two ways that knowledge from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the religion reaches us from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Remember, we take our religion from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ahaduhuma taliqi zahir. Okay. So we're going to do the first one. The first one is that it's, um, the Sharia is communicated to us overtly. And it's very clear. It's mentioned to us. Okay. So how does it come to us overtly? You've covered this with me already at length before Ramadan. This can either happen by way of mutawatir, mass transmission, yeah, or non-mutawatir. So the first category will be that it's overt. It's expressly said to you, you're told about it, and either it will be through mutawatir or it will be non mutawatir. Okay, and I'll go through some examples. Well, mutawatiru minhu al mutawatir lafzan. 
that the mutawati the first time which comes to you is either it'll become like through words like the quran the quran is loves mutawati it's literally the word of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's no there's no idea of zuba hearing something from me and then him expressing it to you in his words right? that can also be a form of mutawati but here zuba is saying exactly what i said word for word sentence for sentence dot for dot okay so loves and the quran is the example so the quran is the literal word of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al mutawatiru loves an qal quran al azim like the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa kan nabz wa kan min al ahadith and a small collection of prophetic traditions the very small ahadith of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have reached us literally as he said them literally as he said them okay and we give one example here um hadasna abru ibn hadasna khalid wa husham and ismail and qais and jarir so this is the hadith from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is mutawatir lafzan and literally this is what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said qala kunna julusan inda nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we were sat with the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam idha nazara ila al qamar laylat al badr we saw we looked our gaze fell upon the moon uh, on a night that it was full قال إنكم سترون ربكم كما ترون هذا القم لا تضامون في رؤيته. That you shall see your Lord as you see this moon. I mean, you will not be wrong in seeing Him. In other words, when you see Allah, you will see Allah سبحانه وتعالى. فإن استطعتم ألا تغلبوا على صلاة قبل طلوع الشمس وصلاة قبل غروب الشمس ففعلوا. Right? And if you are, you are able to, don't miss praying before the sunrise. يعني the fajr. And before it sets, then you don't miss um, fajr and don't miss asr. Yeah, you know, stay upon this practice. <coughs> so, he's probably some saying that you'll see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally, um, like you just seen the moon, that you're able to see the moon as well. It's interesting this hadith, by the way, and we can speculate that he's also talking about two prayers that seem to fall at a time when um, light emerges and when light ends. Yeah, this is very, very interesting. The Prophet ﷺ is using these two particular prayers and he's using them to explain the moon, which is light, the emergence of light of the moon, but also seeing something as well. So he's telling us that uh, in the absence of light, there's darkness. Right? So there's, there's a lot of metaphors uh, that you can derive from this hadith. But the point here, Shah Waliullah rahimahullah is saying, is this is a mutawatir hadith, lafzan. Yani, this is what the Prophet ﷺ literally said. Right? This is what he said, literally word by word. But we don't have as many ahadiths like this. Okay? So, for example, Imam Suyuti has a book uh, I've, I've mentioned in here, Al Azhal Al Mutanasira Fi Al Mutawatira. So, he has a book where he's collected 112 hadiths from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which are Mutawatir Lafzan. So, Mutawatir has two categories. We've done Mutawatir before, anyway, mass transmitted. So, you have Mun Mutawatir, Mutawatir, which is Lafzan. Literally, the Prophet said this. But it's a few collection, but bulk of it is the Quran. The Quran is mutawatir lafzan. Okay. The next one, mutawatir. So we're still talking about the first category. Remember, we're talking about the first category, that the one that the Sharia is given to us overtly. Yeah. Umma min hushar wajhain ahdu atar al zahir, literally is given to you. The second type is wa min mutawatir ma'na. This is like the meaning is communicated to you. So it's not literally the word of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the meaning is given, like the example of Zubah, he hears something from me, he communicates the meaning of it to the rest of us. So many things from rulings regarding Tahara. So this has reached Mutawatir, but they've come Ma'na, in the meaning. For example, Salah, Namaz, many things to do with Namaz. We know namaz is first mutawatir, but the, 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 the ahkam of namaz have come to us mutawatir ma'na, its meaning. Same for zakat, same for fasting, same for hajj, same for finance and trans- buying and selling, same for marriage, same for warfare, conduct of warfare. Mimma lam yakhtali fihi for firqat min al islam that there isn't much debate amongst the ulama amongst this. Like this has reached us mutawatir ma'na. Yeah? It's still mutawatir, but it's ma'na, the meaning is there. Now I just put a footnote here. Usually when you look, you look into books of usul, the hadith of the Prophet are usually dis, uh, split into mutawatir and khabar wahid. Yeah? We'll do khabar wahid in a minute. 
Um, but in the Hanafi works, remember what do we have? Anyone remember? The third, the second category, the middle one. Mashur. We have a mashur one which is like the wajib, if you like. Yeah? So if we have mutawatir, we have mashur and then we have khabar wahid. There, there was a difference between mutawatir and mashur. Anybody remember? There's a slight difference between them two. From the Sahaba onwards. What about Mashur? Later on, yeah. But it's, it's almost Mutawatir anyway. But during Tabi'in, Tabi'in, the second generation, it became Mutawatir then. But it's a slight technical difference, but really it's Mutawatir anyway. Yeah? And Khabar Wahid is singular translations, okay? Or Khabar Wahid or Khabar Ahai, we call them, okay? Um, here, just put a note. That, so Hanafis have a slightly different discussion when it comes to Hadith. Right, the Sahih, Za'if, that, that comes later on, I'll mention in a minute. Okay, so we have, when we reach, when, we, when something reaches from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it will be mutawatir, <coughs> lafzan, right? Literally from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said this, this is what he said. Like the few hadith that I mentioned, like the one I've mentioned up there. And obviously the Quran is mutawatir, lafzan. Then you also have mutawatir, which is ma'nan. The meaning, the import of it is given to us, right? Um, so this is something to bear in mind as well. So these are examples that I give. Is everybody okay with that? Because often people think mutawati must be a literal word. It doesn't have to be. It can be the meaning as well. Okay? Okay. Thereafter, so you have mutawati, lafzan, mutawati, ma'nan, and then you have things that are not non mutawati So they fall below the mutawati category. وَغَيْرُ mutawati أَعْلَى دَرَجَةُ الْمُسْتَفِيزِ The most... Uh, Shah Sahib used the word mustafiz, but we use the word mashur. Yeah? So he says, Adarajatu al mustafiz, they are mustafiz, um, or they are mashur. That which has been transmitted by three or more companions. Yeah? So not mutawatir, but three or more companions. But it's still a very strong hadith, right? Fasa'idan. Um, and it continued. Summa lam yazil yazid al ruwad ila tabqad al khamisa. That it continued to increase in terms of narrators until the fifth generation. So it became like mass transmission later on. Okay. Wahada Qisman Kathir Wujud. Most of the hadith collections will be in this one. Kathir Wujud. Most of them will be in the uh, Mustafiz or Mashhur category. <coughs> Very important category. Wahada Qisman Kathir Wujud. Wa alayhi bina rusul fiqh. And fiqh um, get most of their rulings from Mashhur hadith. A qaid coming from the top one. You can't base a qa'id, well you can, but it's not a strong form of evidence to base a qa'id mashur. You have to base a qa'id on Quran and Sunnah that is mutawatir because it's belief. That's why we don't have many things in our belief. It's a very small category, mashallah, alhamdulillah, right? It, there's not much you need to believe in to become a Muslim, if you like, right? So fiqh is mashur. So when, I, when I, we go back to Quduri, inshallah, next few weeks, whenever we go back, inshallah, bear this in mind. And we have these categories. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Thumma al-khabaru al-muqdi lahu bis-sihhati awi hasan ala asri al-huffaz al-muhaddithin wa kubrahim. Then you go, you, the, the fuqaha move out of the way and then you have the next category which is um, reports which are judged to be sahih, hasan according to the muhaddithin. Yeah. So the muhaddithin have their own terminologies. So you have mutawatir lafzan, you have mutawatir ma'nan, then you have uh, mashhur or mustafiz, and then you have the sahaba, uh, the st- muhaddisin, they have their own category. Okay? According to scholars who memorize hadith as well. Okay? So this is the next category, sahih, hasan, and so forth. You know, you see these in the books. Everybody okay with that? Thumma akhbarun fiha kalamun qablaha ba'dun. So then there are other hadiths that come after them which there's, there's discussion on. Is it sahih? Is it authentic? Is it, what, what is it? Yeah? Um, but people haven't accepted them. Okay? So there's, there's ikhtilaf among these. So once you get into this category, you know, the, it's all open. It's very much up for debate, academic discussions take place. And, you know, you can, you can move it in different directions. Okay? Um, now what they normally do is if you have a hadith that falls into this lower category they'll try and find it support for par- parallel transmission so can we find another hadith that comes from the sanad does that make sense from fulan 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 okay we've only got this one can we find it from somebody else that will give it support yeah makes sense like zubay says something to me or zubay mentions something from me for example 
right? And it gets passed on, passed on, passed on. It's not very strong, really. But then the same statement, Zoom, uh, this, uh, you might have heard it from me, right? And then, okay, that's another chain that we have, passed on, passed on, right? And then Sajid says, then we get another one that comes through Sajid. Does that make <coughs> sense? So we have these different ways, and then they support one another. So then that strengthens the narration, because we know that more people have mentioned it, gone through different narrations, okay? Uh, or by statements of scholars, so we value scholars saying things as well. So scholars might have said, you know what, not many people have mentioned this, but it's from, from their wide reading, it seems to be an some sort of authentic transmission or that we can take something from it. It's like anything today, you know, if you're, if you're an expert in the field and someone says something in the field, even though uh, it might not be the most famous opinion, the people who are experts in the field say, you know what, that, yeah, that view seems to be quite legitimate within the field, like in medicine or wherever, right? So unless someone comes up with something <coughs> wacky, then the people in the field will know that you know what this this can't be this can't be something the Prophet would have said, but it comes from experience. Okay. Uh, so he says when you have this, when you find parallel transmissions, ulama have said, uh, or um, there's there's a clear understanding that this this is something that Prophet would have said, right? Then you must act upon it in some way, shape, or form. Does that make sense? But it's not as strong evidence as the other forms of evidence. So remember epistemology, mutawatir we had, then we had mashur and we had ahad, remember? Yeah. Um, so this is very, very important to bear in mind that everything else beside the mashur will fall into ahad category. But what you want to do is stick to the mutawatir. Mutawatir loves the Quran. This is why I would say to people like, why do you want to move away from the Quran and look at other things when the Quran is most authentic? And you want to stick to mutawatir hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're the strongest form ever. If you can pull those out, to defend your argument, you've got a very strong argument. Then you have Mashhur Mustafis, which are mutawatir in essence, because from the second generation onward, <coughs> they became mass transmitted. And then you have the Ahad, which is everything else that falls below that. Ahad, you have to be a lot more relaxed in, uh, in the sense of, you know, it's, it's because there's different opinions on it. Um, there's all debate taking place amongst the scholars. Okay. Now, um, I'll, I'm not going to go on for too long, but So who are um, Yeah, so let's, let's move on the second type. The second type is where So everybody's okay with that. A very brief overview of uh, One strand of knowledge that reaches from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Which is through chain of narrations basically. That's what we're talking about on Mutawatir chain of narrations. Now you go on to the next level, the second level. Remember we said at the beginning there's two types of knowledge that reaches from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay? Talaqi Zahir, the overt one, and then there is the through indication. This comes through indication. So I'll give you some examples of that also, inshallah. Okay, so. Wasanya Talaqi Dalala, that it reaches us by communication, dala indication. Uh, so what is it? That an yara sahaba, the sahaba saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying something, doing something, and they've taken a hukum from that. Can you see the difference here? One is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said something, which is one form of knowledge. One is the sahaba they observed him saying something or doing something, and they've ru they've come out with their own ruling from it, or they've come out with their own understanding. There's two ways that you something will reach you from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it makes sense. Right, you know, people mention it to you that my sheikh said this, my sheikh said this, my sheikh said this, or he he would have done this. Right? So that's istimbat you're doing from the sheikh. And one is the sheikh literally said that. So the Prophet said something. He made he he told you you need to do something. You need to stay away from it. That's 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 the that's the sunnah. But here we're talking about the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, so the Prophet spoke about something. He acted, and then what they do is they they derive rulings from this. Okay. So then we mentioned some companions which I will end with inshallah. Wa akabir hazal waj Umar, Ali, Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Abbas. Okay, so uh, in the Hanafi school, I've mentioned this before, that we have fuqaha sahaba and we have non fuqaha sahaba. If you remember this, we have sahaba that we, we categorize, and this is not a stain on them, na'udhu billah min zalik, but we say that they understood legal pronouncements better than others. Okay, and that's natural. Some people understood things better than others. Okay. Um, as for others besides them, though they were able to avail of the principle of indication, they were able to understand, they were not able to distinguish between what was a pillar 
and what was a condition. So they want they want us they want as legally minded as other companions were. So Umar was someone that was outstanding, Ali was outstanding, Ibn Masur, Ibn Abbas, and many of the ahadis have reached us as well. I'll go into separate discussion about them later on, about other companions. Okay. And then we have Umar, Aisha, Zayn bin Sabit. May Allah be pleased with all of them. Okay, so I just want to mention this footnote and I'll end here, inshallah. So Imam Sarakhsi, who is one of the people that we quoted when we were doing on the whiteboard, who's a, a, a scholar in, in Hanafi school, he says that um, for the Hanafis, they fit into two broad categories, known and unknown, ma'roof and majhul. Okay, so the former are those components whose reports are decisive in that they cause... Um, they cause us preponderant knowledge of the truth. In other words, when they say something, it's pretty much, it's very strong, right? Um, so in, in addition to the ones I mentioned above, we have the four rightly guided Khalifs. When they say something, because they were the Khalifs, right? When they say something, it's very strong form of evidence. So this is what you do when you look at statements of the companions. When you look at the Isnad, you also look at statements of the companions. May Allah be pleased with all of them. And then what you do is you look at the name of the companion, which companion is mentioned in this narration as well. Okay, so we have the four companions. Then you have Mu'az ibn Jabal. Mu'az was very famous. You remember the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam walked with him when he went to Yemen, right? And he was a scholar in his own right. And Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala. Okay, so this is important. They must be followed. This is in the Hanafi school. When they say something, they must be followed irrespective of whether their uh, uh, reports agree with Qiyas or not. So whether it makes sense or not, when they say something, you follow it. If it's a strong hadith and they say something, we've done this before, I give some examples on the whiteboard. When they say something, because we see them as fuqaha, we say we follow them. Yeah. And the second time, um, who are known for obviously being upright and being very precise, um, but were limited in fiqh. They include Abu Huraira and Nasim bin Malik. Okay? So as an example, so when they say something, if it agrees with the Qiyas, we accept it. But if it contradicts Qiyas, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't go against rational understanding, okay? We only accept it if the Ummah accepts them, okay? Um, otherwise, we sanction, we take Qiyas as a preference. Does that make sense? So I've talked about this before. I gave some <coughs> examples where he said something in Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and then corrected him, right? So we have this slight nuance. When something reaches from the compi companions, or when we're looking at statements of the companions, we kind of create two broad categories. One is, we look at a companion, is he someone that was a faqih in his own right, and a non-faqih? And we actually do this today, today as well. When you look at an alim or a scholar or a religious person, right, they always say you take knowledge from a religious person who is knowledgeable of the deen. Right? You don't take religion from someone who is just pious. Yeah. This is important. You don't take your Sharia from someone who might be, mashallah, very pious. They, might, they may be very, very pious, but you don't take your deen from them if they don't know the deen themselves. So for us, it's a, it's a very important thing for us as Muslims that we take our deen, our fiqh, from ulama who are fuqaha, who are engaged in the legal understanding of the Sharia as well. Otherwise, what will happen? Right? They, they won't know what's going on. They won't know the deeper meanings. And it'll start saying things and making pronouncements and that will cause confusion and that will cause a lot of problems as well. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of briefly introduce this. I don't want to go into any more detail. And let's quickly recap. So, how does knowledge reach us from the Prophet ﷺ? One way is through mutawatir, through the hadith genre in terms of directly from him. So you have every isnad, you have mutawatir. The mutawatir can be lovesy. Literally, the words of the Prophet it has a very strong force, or it can be ma'nawi, the meaning, like the rulings to do with zakat and so forth. They're both mutawatir, right? It's just the way, it's, it's just a slight nuance in the way it reaches us. It's a very strong form of evidence, mutawatir. Then you have uh, what's called uh, mashhur or mustafis, right? So mutawatir is, is immediately from the Prophet's time, it was mass transmitted. Mashhur is from the first generation onwards. It becomes mass transmitted. So it's mutawatir anyway, but it's just in the first generation it was mashur. Right? But it's also a very strong form of evidence. Mashur hadith or mustafiz hadith. Then you have the third category, which is um, the statements of the uh, sah uh, of the, uh, the scholars of hadith. Right? What they say. And then that falls broadly under mashur. Uh, not mashur, khabar wahid. 
right? The Khabar Wahid, they loan or solitary reports, but they can become strong if you can find support for them. So if a statement comes to you, you find other ways, then it becomes it can get elevated. Okay, and they will sift through all of this. But it's never going to be as strong as Mutawatir and Mashur in many ways. But you have a lot of leeway in them. Right? And you can't base your belief on their, those hadiths. Right? Because they, they're not Mutawatir. Okay? And um, you obviously, if someone refused them, you can call them sinful, but you can never call them non-Muslim. We've talked about this before as well. And then you have ones where there's a lot of debate over. So this is like a, 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 a level, four levels, if you like. So that Shah Waliullah, Rahimahullah, is explaining to us through here. And then I talked about um, non uh, Sorry, and then I talked about um, the second type of knowledge which reaches us from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is dalala, right? That they they observe the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They he, they hear him say something, and then they derive rulings from that, right? They say, you know, this is what the ruling is for this. And so you see this in many many places where books of hadith, um, people come of, of, don't read it properly, and they say the Prophet said this in Bukhari. The Prophet might have not said that. It's a companion saying it. So you have to be careful. Is a companion saying it or is a prophet saying this? Yeah. So that's very, very important. So that's the second way that the companions say that we saw the Prophet doing this. We saw him eating like this. We saw him saying this. Yeah. So and so they, they take that dalala from the Prophet. So this is very, very important. And then um, when we look at this from the companions, we also, as Hanafis and Ufuqaha, we differentiate between companions as well right so if there's no problems that's fine you take it but if there's issues in in the transmission you're trying to work out which one to do amal upon then you're going to go for the ones that are narrated by the fuqaha and we have a list of them and um, i mean if you ever want to read a good book in the hanafi school if you know arabic is this one dirasat fi usul al-hadith ala manhaj al-hanafiya right and uh, Sheikh uh, Abdul Majid Turkumani, mashallah, is a lovely book. He goes through all of this, but I'm not going through that because uh, that's not our purpose. We're not, we're not studying hadith here as such. Is that okay? We'll stop there, inshallah, for today.